you could bring it into your own experience by imagining if somebody came along and said you need to move. And you know, we're a fairly transient society, we tend to move, but even in our transience, thinking about moving, we all create a sense of home wherever we are, whatever that means to us. So, you know, it's a deeper emotional and psychological issue that I think we need to consider. It's not just a matter of moving chess players around on a chessboard. It's more about finding a way to work on this together as a global community. The Brookings LSE project on internal displacement was set up back in 1994 to work very closely with the UN to promote the rights of people displaced within the borders of their countries. People who are displaced by violence or conflict like Syria today, people displaced by natural disasters, but also people displaced by the effects of climate change. Human rights doctrine needs to be incorporated into any form of a relocation governance structure because the relocations that have happened to indigenous peoples have always been forced by government and have led to their impoverishment and social fragmentation. If we think that relocation is going to be the only adaptation strategy that will protect us from the climate events that are happening, we need to make sure that people and communities will be resilient, and the only way to do that is to make sure that our human rights are protected. Communities need to be making the decisions about what adaptation strategies are going to work. And in order to do that, um, we need to create uh, what I call an adaptive governance framework, which means that Communities and governments work together so that if protection in place, meaning erosion and flood control methods don't work, that we then move from protection in place to community relocation. And there would be indicators that community residents would agree to, um, along with the government, where we would say, for instance, there have been three extreme weather events that have destroyed this school now three times and it's really not feasible because of sea level rise for us to rebuild this school in this location. So what do we need to do in regard to children going to school? So that would be like one example, public health indicators. Coastal communities are going to be dealing with saline intrusion in their water supply. Um, and so if that saline intrusion in water supplies happens and it's not possible for communities living on the coast to get access to potable water, that would be another indicator that it, a community needs to relocate. Alaska can really provide a model in regard to what other parts of the United States need to do so that we can be more proactive in responding to the climate change impacts that are happening, especially in our coastal areas. I am very passionate about this issue because of the urgency that I see climate change happening. When I went back to graduate school in 2007, the climate scientists at that time were saying that there would be no Arctic sea ice at the earliest 2050, but most probably by 2100. And now in 2012, we just documented the record low, the new record low. There was a record low in 2007 as well, but the climate scientists were saying it was an anomaly. And now they're recognizing that we've actually maybe passed a tipping point where there may be no Arctic sea ice during the summertime as early as 20 and 20. And so that causes me to be extraordinarily concerned, um, not only for Alaskan indigenous communities, but all of us who depend on Arctic ice to cool our planet. The area where I work is in northeastern Siberia. Since 2006, I've worked on issues of climate change as it's become more and more of an issue for them. So climate change is altering their environment, affecting their livelihood. I would say the main issue is the 
melting of the permafrost. As the air temperature increases, so does the temperature of the permafrost. Permafrost is very important in this ecosystem because it basically is what holds the land up. <laughs> it's the foundation of the land. So as the permafrost uh, warms, the land starts to fall and rise. Uh, the other, I would say, main effect that's um, really coming into play is the change in the precipitation patterns. Any group that has adapted to a northern uh, ecosystem has a very refined adaptation, which means they depend on very specific timings of seasons of precipitation. They've adapted to those cycles. Once the timing of those cycles and those seasonal changes starts to be different from what they've adapted to, it's like pulling the rug out from underneath them. It's very difficult to find a way to feed their families. So a lot of the work is, is teasing out exactly what the origin of change is, which can be several, and then understanding what extent it's climate, and then being able to bring that into the vernacular. So talking about it in a way where local people will get it. So we had uh, knowledge exchanges in the summer of 2010. We actually worked in the four communities where I do my research, and we also visited four regional centers um, along the Vilui. And we set it up so that local people could come as the audience, but as active participants. We began by letting them talk about changes they've observed. We showed our research with the nine changes, the way we did our work with the local communities. And then Alexander Fyodorov, the permafrost specialist that I've been working with, gave a presentation about his research. The people in the audience who get up and talk about what they're observing are specialists in their own right. And that's the way we value them and refer to them. They have a kind of knowledge that is very needed in this larger understanding of climate change because it's telling us that it's, there's not one silver bullet to solve this problem. If there's any solution, it's going into local contexts and appreciating the diversity of ways that this global phenomena is affecting not only ecosystems, but cultures. As a think tank, an independent research institute, the Brookings Institution, I think, is in a unique, unique place to raise these issues to public awareness, to do some credible, high-quality, policy-relevant research that can guide policymakers. Sometimes, for example, there are groups that are directly impacted by climate change but don't have access to people in positions of power. So if there are ways that we can bring those voices or those concerns to the U.S. government or the United Nations or other governments, that I think would be a real contribution.